Hey, this is Joel Duff. Welcome back to my channel. And I'm just jumping on here for a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about some things that Ken Ham has said recently. So put this under the title of uh, an episode of Ham Bites. Um, yeah, Ken Ham has taken to, in his semi-retirement, to writing long-form posts on Twitter and Facebook and then eventually putting them on the blog on Answers in Genesis. And so it seems like he must sit down at his desk every day and it's like, what can I write about? And half the things you write about, of course, are what's wrong with everybody else. Yeah. And he's been going after the compromisers, as he often does. And he's been talking about John Lennox uh, the last, uh, I guess, I guess uh, yesterday, had a long post about John Lennox, who's a uh, mathematician, academic from England. And he wrote the book that uh, you see right here below me um, on a seven, you know, his view of a seven-day creation and interpretation of Genesis one. Uh, and Ken Ham doesn't agree with it, of course, because John Lennox believes in an ancient Earth versus a young Earth. And what Ken Ham is doing here, and this is the reason I I jumped on here, is because Ken Ham is saying something that I hear him say all the time, and it just it just bothers me. And uh, um. You know, he's asking a question, why is it that so many Christian academics and leaders compromise God's word in Genesis with evolution in millions of years? And then in reference to John Lennox's writing from England, which he spoke about yesterday, having pondered this and carefully considered the reactions that we challenge when we challenge such compromisers with what God clearly states in his word, right? We know what God clearly states. Everyone else who doesn't believe that is a compromiser. Why is it that they compromise? I mean, this is a question that's often asked of Ken Ham at meetings. Well, if it's so clear, why is it that uh, you have so much resistance, a tremendous amount of resistance uh, within the church, you know, not from the secular community, but within the church, Ken Ham meets this type of resistance. And so this is his go-to answer. We believe it comes down to the issue of academic intellectual pride and academic peer pressure. Right, John Lennox, um, doesn't want to offend his academic peers and therefore has taken this position of an old earth versus the clear teaching of the word. In an era where there's been so much emphasis on college education, there's been a great deal of peer pressure to fit in with the academics of our age. It seems to us that many Christian leaders and academics are prepared to be scoffed at for believing in the resurrection, virgin birth, etc., for believing in six literal days, the young earth, global flood, and literal Adam and Eve. In that sense, perhaps the words of John are fitting here. Not John Lennox. Gospel John, right? John. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. All right? Obviously, that verse is talking about John Lennox. But not only John Lennox, but C.S. Lewis, B.B. Warfield, and A.A. A. Hodge, and... Uh, Gresham Machen, who I've been reading about a lot, uh, a lot lately, All right? Many, many great Christian theologians that have stood behind the Word of God, you know, supporting the authority of scriptures that Ken Ham finds so important. What about Billy Graham? We could go down a long, long list of apparent compromisers who, what their, what their real issue is, is pride. They're scared to speak the truth, except that you know, these people I'm, these people that I'm, uh, I'm mentioning, were certainly no wallflowers, right? They put their careers on the line for scriptures, right? For a proper understanding of scripture, right? Spoke out, wrote, endured ridicule, ridicule from from uh, you know the secular community, right? Some were academics and some weren't academics. And then I'm often, you know, and, and I've heard this for myself, right? Well, you have that uh, position. You're scared to lose your job. That's why you spend all this time doing this. Yeah, that's why I spend all this time doing this, which, um, you know, probably costs me, you know, uh, increases in salary because I'm not doing as much as I could to, to get ahead of everybody else. I'm not, um, I'm spending an enormous amount of my free time I was up very late last night uh, recording a video and then editing it early this morning. Uh, yeah, that's my academic pride, right? That's the peer pressure I feel from around me making me do that. Now, I, I find this uh, quite silly, right? Uh, this, this particular argument. 
doesn't fly at all. Does Ken Ham know these individuals? Has he sat down and talked to them? Does he know what their witness is, what their, where they place their real faith? Where they place their trust, um, I'll I'll say it's you know this argument is offensive, it is, and and not in a good way that that, that uh, Ken Ham would say that the gospel needs to be offensive. This is just offensive. All right, let's just read on just a little bit further, because evolution and millions of years are really anti-God religion of this age. The secular academics intimidate Christians into adopting their ideas. And then we get down to a second argument that Ken Ham has against the compromisers. On the issue of inspiration authority, John Lennox raises another common argument against a literal Genesis. Genesis is, of course, a text that comes to us from a time and a culture very different than our own. It is from the ancient Near East, so we cannot simply read it as if it were a contemporary Western document written to address contemporary Western concerns. Well, I mean, of course, John Lennox is, is very right, and... Um, Ken Ham, uh, fascinatingly, and, and I've pointed this out in many videos, is a product of Western culture himself and back reads into these texts his own perspectives. As much as he says that he is taking the Bible on face value, it's not the face value scriptures of the original audience. Um, but let's, let's, let's not digress. But I want to get to this next paragraph. Of course, when such an argument is used to deny the historicity of Genesis, it totally contradicts what Scripture says about its own perspicuity. Right? It's a word for clarity. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.16, all right, one of the go-to verses here, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness, that the man of God may be complete through a thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right? This is actually... Uh, this way, this is not a verse that speaks of the perspicuity of Scripture, all right, the clarity of Scripture. This verse speaks of the fact that all Scriptures are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and correction. It doesn't say that all Scriptures are equally clear. Kenham seems to think that every single word in Scripture uh, is equally clear, and that every passage uh, speaks to everything we want it to speak to. But the real issue is, what does the author and what does the passage, ultimately God, trying to communicate in this particular passage? And for those things that are important for us to know, for instruction and in righteousness, that, that we might be complete, right? Those things are clear. Not everything in Scripture is equally clear, right? And I think right here, what I want to do is I want to go to the Westminster Confession of Faith. And uh, let's read what the divine said. Uh, when they wrote about the perspicuity of Scripture. So I just jumped onto the Orthodox was Presbyterian Church website where I know this is my go-to site to find the Confession of Faith uh, online. And we go to Unholy Scripture. Right, chapter one. Um, okay, here's the, relevant, here's the relevant portion here in part six. Actually, part six and part seven. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequences may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelation of the Spirit or traditions of men. Nevertheless, we acknowledge the inward illumination of the Spirit, traditions of men. I mean, of course, this is a reference to the, uh, you know, the Catholic Church, which the uh, Protestant uh, Reformation is breaking away from. Uh, and they would say that the Catholic Church adds a lot of things that are traditions of men to the truths of Scripture. But nevertheless, we acknowledge that the inward illumination of the Spirit of God to be necessary for the saving understanding of such things that are revealed in the Word, and that there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God, the government of the Church, common to human actions and societies, which are to be ordered by the light of nature. In other words, God has given us this world and minds to understand the world. And we, through our uh, creative capacity of being made in the image of God, will discover and uh, deduce ways to uh, govern the church, you know, our actions in society and other things can actually be determined by looking at nature, not, in other words, all the rules for how we live life aren't necessarily written exactly in scripture. And this clear fact, thou shalt do this. Thou shalt, you know, have this form of government. Um, 
and Christian prudence according to the general rules of God, which are always to be observed. Okay, now here's, here's the key part. All things in scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place in scripture or other that not only the learned, but the unlearned in due use of their ordinary means may attain to the sufficient understanding of them. What Ken Ham is suggesting here is that knowing the age of the earth is necessary for salvation, right? And therefore must be clear in the scriptures. All things that are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are clearly propounded in scriptures. It doesn't say that everything else that the scriptures mention in passing is absolutely clear, right? The authors of Genesis, if they weren't necessarily in, if their concern and God was concerned with, here's what you have to know about um, the exact origins and the method of how I created. If that's exactly what you need to know, then the scriptures should be clear about that because you have to know it for in order to be saved. Right. But if that's not something that is necessary for you to understand God and have a relationship with God, right? It's not necessary for salvation. It's not necessarily clearly set down in scripture. Right? Scriptures are not alike plain in themselves. Ken Ham likes to say that anybody could just pick up the Bible, read it, and understand um, that the world is six thousand years old. And sure enough, you might pick up the Bible and get that impression from it, and many people have. Uh, but of course, not all through history. Um, but is that necessary? Is that a is that what the scriptures intended to teach and were clear on that particular point because it was necessary for salvation? I can't even say this isn't a salvific issue, that you can believe the earth is old. Um, but on the other hand, he is saying the scriptures are absolutely clear. Yeah, so if we come back here and we see what Ken Ham is, is arguing again, of course, when the, such an argument is used to deny the historicity of Genesis, right? Again, he's saying that John Lennox and, and all these other devout Christians, really, you know, some of the, the heroes of the faith were denying the history of Genesis. I don't think of any of them as denying the historicity of Genesis. It totally contradicts what scripture says about its own perspicuity. No. I mean, here Timothy is just saying that all scripture is profitable, right? That doesn't mean every single thing we try to draw out of scripture is profitable, right? All scripture for what it was intended to say is profitable. And then the question becomes, what did it intend to say? What did it mean to the original? And that's where John Lennox is coming in. The text comes to us from a time and culture very different from Rome. It is from the ancient Near East, so we cannot simply read it as if it were a contemporary Western document written to address contemporary Western concerns, like our desire to know the physical origins of the universe and exactly how that came about. All right, if that's something we want to know, but the original author was not communicating, then we're importing our desires to have questions answered from Genesis. And Genesis may answer many questions that are important to us, but they don't necessarily answer all questions. And it's just a self in the Westminster Confession of Faith that um, not everything is equally clear in scriptures, right? The things that are clear are the things that are important. Now, Ken Ham deems this to be very, very important and therefore necessary to, um, to understand. Ken Ham could really use some time spent uh, reading some Augustine and other church fathers uh, and seeing them struggle with interpreting Genesis. Go look at uh, Luther and uh, read his works on Genesis and, and hear his wise words about, um, you know, how, uh, I forget exactly how he put it, but it was, it was basically the idea of, uh, you know, with much trepidation, does one come to um, the book of Genesis and the early chapters of Genesis and feel that they can uh, fully resolve, uh, you know, the how to understand uh, those chapters, right? And he lived well before this scientific age. I mean, everyone that I read recognizes that uh, these passages are not perspicuous. They're not clear. And maybe they're not 
clear because they're not answering the questions that we wish to ask of scriptures. All right, that's it for me. I guess I, I better get back to work. I have a lot of things to do today. Uh, I got to get back to uh, seeking the praise of men, apparently, because I'm, I'm, I'm scared to praise God uh, in front of the world, and I'm scared to face the truth uh, in my compromising ways. All right, until next time, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.